1-1 on the night, 4-4 on aggregate, they advance 4-3 on penalties. So many things to discuss with this game as we welcome in uh, Stuart Robson and also a very smug Jurgen Klinsmann who've got every prediction right. Yeah, way, super! We, we we're looking ahead as to who is going to qualify uh, for the <laughs> semi-finals. People have forgot about that. You don't have to bring it back. Oh, it's all right. That's OK. Where do we start? Well, tell me, where do you want to start? Well, this is one for the, all those people who know nothing else other than to read stats. Mm. And, and, you know... They go on social media and they, they're all over the place telling you how he's done this and they've done that and XG and this because it boils down to, at the end of the day, putting the ball in the back of the net and defending well. And Real Madrid in the end did both and we can look at City and say, well, they didn't do enough. But, I mean, in terms of a contest, it wasn't... The first game was a really good contest. Yes. Madrid, 3-3, entertaining, end-to-end... -end. Counter-attack most of the time, I suppose, from Real Madrid. This really wasn't much of a contest. It was so one-sided. But we've seen Real Madrid do this so many times. And we wondered, well, last year they were going to do it again. Well, they didn't. They fell flat in the face. In fact, they got a big, they got a big dose of pie in their face last year. They got hammered, but they didn't. They learned their lessons. City did not. Uh, they lost, I'm, I'm thinking, at least one, maybe two bad goals in Madrid. They lost another bad goal early on here. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, and we've talked about it all year, all season, they'll get away with it in the Premier League, it looks like. They haven't got away with it in this competition. They've not been as good defensively as last year. Maybe some would say they haven't been as good in the final third as well going forward. But they certainly haven't been as good defensively in this competition or the Premier League, and they've paid the penalty for that. Uh, we saw in those highlights, didn't we, Ali? You look at... The amount of ball that Manchester City had didn't necessarily convert into many clear-cut chances. Was that down to Real Madrid parking the bus or down to a lack of creativity from Manchester well, City? You can give credit to Real Madrid, but they didn't have any other option. They didn't have any other choice. It's not like when they won the ball, now they were going on the counter or they were completing passes. No, Real Madrid was pushed back, pushed back, pushed back. And so the only option that they had was hang on and hang on as best as they possibly could. So then the onus and the responsibility is on Manchester City. Now, I have a few questions okay. structurally for Manchester City. And while Manuel Akanji can do a job offensively, I suppose, and he can add himself into the midfield and create a numbers mismatch, I don't know that if I'm Manchester City, a Manchester City fan or a Manchester City player for that matter, I want Manuel Akanji being the one who's a decision maker top of the 18-yard box or inside the 18-yard box. As good a job as he may do, he's not a better option than Foden or Kevin De Bruyne or some of these other sort of more skilled players in the attack. And yet, so many times, maybe it's by design by Real Madrid, but certainly it didn't seem to be the case, Manuel Akanji is the one that is trying to play, make top of the 18-yard box. Where are the other guys? The other thing that I would ask, if you have Doku coming on the field, right, and you have proven that it's a 1v1 mismatch against Carvajal, why are there players of Manchester City actually crowding the left-hand side and making runs in behind Carvajal? No, 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 no. Clear out. Clear out. You have a mismatch. Take advantage of it. And the speed of Doku was always going to create problems. I don't understand why Manchester City just kind of, they dwell on this passing, passing game sideways and back and sideways and back. And it comes around the box and around to the other side. You never use Erling Haaland. And the times that you try to use Erling Haaland, he was not strong enough to hold it with his back to goal. In the end, it becomes predictable and easier to defend. Uh, Robbo, is it fair to, analysis, uh, to analyze this game in a in a critique of Manchester City, given the amount of ball that they had against a side like Real Madrid? Uh, absolutely, yes. Real Madrid defended their penalty box really well. But there was times when Manchester City, and you know, they, they got a couple of crosses in in the first half, and the only things that Haaland did right, he won two balls in the air. One that hit the crossbar, and there was another one that he didn't quite get back into the danger area. But apart from that, they, part, they tried to pass their way through. Yes, they got the Bruyne in a couple of times down the right-hand side in that inside right position. Unfortunately, it was also a Kanji that got into the inside left position a couple of times as well. But at times, they have to change their game. Real Madrid was set up to, to stop them passing through them. And Manchester City kept on trying to pass through them, all going wide again and then coming back in again. They then put Bernardo Silva out to the right-hand side. And I don't think he ever went past anybody. He kept on playing it back to Kevin De Bruyne. Kevin De Bruyne played it square to Roger. It went over the other side. At some point, you have to throw the ball into the box, bend balls in, whip balls in, and just make defenders defend. Manchester City didn't do that enough. You saw the stats. 67% possession and 33 shots. 
You have to score more than that when you have that sort of possession. How do you approach it, Jürgen, if you're Manchester City and you come up against this bank of four and four? How do you try and break this down? And isn't Pep Guardiola experienced enough to try or certainly explore a plan B? Uh, but as I kind of gave a good example, you know, with Doku coming in, he needs space to get in there. He needs space to, to get behind his man and, uh, and not overcrowd in that area. This is certainly one, one aspect that you can discuss afterwards. Then you obviously you had the, um, the post being hit by, by Haaland. You had the big chance from De Bruyne. You rely on your big, big players in a game like that, that they make from very little, that they, they make more. Uh, that was not the case. But, I mean, if you look at the stats, uh, like what was said rightfully, you know, you had 70, almost 70 percent and, and you pass the ball around, around, around. You need to kind of come out with a little bit more, with a little bit more de determinated kind of uh, uh, results. I mean, more, uh, uh, yeah, in a certain way, I had the feeling sometimes that there, there was not the urgency that you need to have at the end, especially the last maybe 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Mm. Uh, you got to give it a go. You got to get the crowd behind you. The crowd was certainly they are behind them, but but there's another level of of uh, support. You know, when you make it look desperate, when you make it look really urgent, and you 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 kind of really try to force to force a goal, and that was somehow you had the feeling. Okay, then we go into extra time. We go maybe we get a chance or two in extra time. And we decided then an extra time, and that haunts you. And for sure, De Bruyne will sit now in the in the dressing room, and he will not be happy because that was a huge chance that he had. Even if I think he had an overall uh, good game, and those are the moments that you regret afterwards. And and uh, Real Madrid had a clear plan. Carlo Ancelotti, obviously, he knew what happened last year. <laughs> you know, he said it's not going to happen a second time. I'm, I'm Italian. I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going uh, an open uh, eye to eye. Um, kind of a, a contest here. Um, so they played defensively very disciplined, very strong, uh, and, uh, and always were, were waiting for their counter-break chances, um, which they then utilized in the, in the first half right away. Um, and then it gets down to a nail-biter. It gets down to, um, to a penalty shootout that uh, both, both coaches prepare their teams um, for the penalty shootout. They have their list. They have their players that uh, are supposed to uh, be the top guys to get you through then, even if it's uh, so late in a game. And, uh, uh, and Real Madrid is now, is now through it. I think, you know, this, in a certain way, they deserved it, even if, obviously, Man City had a uh, majority of the game. It's unbelievable the amount of times they've been able to do it. Real Madrid, obviously, not last year. But I think we have to address one of the big talking points is that how many big teams would have taken off Arguably the hottest striker on the planet. Yeah, now this is this is at the end of the 90 minutes. And I don't mean the hottest as in form right now. Yep. But I mean, if it was an auction out there tomorrow, it would be Mbappe, and it would be Erling Haaland, wouldn't it? Maybe with a couple of other uh, talented players thrown in. But here we have a whether he's having his best game or not his best game. When you bring Doko on, you're looking at pace. And I get it, want to bring Alvarez on. I get that because he's been excellent, but maybe you could bring him on for a Bernardo Silva, then you got another attacking option. Because as the, more t as, as the game wears on and the fatigue kicks in and the, def the constant defending that Real Madrid were having to do, and we saw how tired those guys were, uh, they would have, I, I think, this, uh, as City got more balls into the box or they should have done. And one of the things that, not that they're ever a team that puts lots of balls into the box, they're not. And that is one sort of criticism I would have at times. Uh, particularly if I was a striker, it, it, even in the Premier League, I would like to see more crosses go in. And I think Ellen Haaland would say the same thing. Uh, but it really took that opportunity to do it away. Mm -hmm. You know, the big yeah. dog award... There was no other option. It had to go in, it got, it had to go in hard and low. Now, they got a goal from it, to be fair, but it always had to go in hard and low, across the face. It could never be stood up as an extra time because there's nobody to go and win it. And you have to feel, I think, that as they got more tired and Rudiger was defending and Nacho was just defending and defending and Carvajal couldn't move, had to be taken off, that taking off the talisman of the number nine in the game in the Champions League quarter-final when you need a goal to stop it going to penalties was a huge call. Or was it, was it an indictment on his form in these last two games? Well, it's an indictment on his form and it's also maybe an indictment on his manager. Even though he said something different in press, conference, re press conferences recently, his lack of confidence. 
because if he had confidence yeah. that he's talked about, he's been to the, he's been in the media and he's rubbished any pundit who suggested that Ellen Hallam was having a bad time, right, or a or a slightly poorer time, but yet here he is in his moment of truth and he's taken him off, right, and that's a big call. Now if it if they win and De Bruyne scores and and don't forget he's taken a he's, he's taken a penalty as well, mm -hmm. Haaland. Absolutely, he's taken a penalty. So that was huge. That was huge from Guardiola, and I think on this time, he's got it wrong. And a and, and couple of things about that. You have the focal point in the attack in Erling Haaland. And so, as the defenders indeed are getting tired, they still keep an eye. If they're going to keep an eye on one player, mm. it's going to be Erling Haaland. So, if you have an additional presence in the box, in the case of Julian Alvarez coming in potentially for Bernardo Silva, now, as everybody gets dragged to Erling Haaland, he may not even have to be the guy who scores it. But now Julian Alvarez finds himself in a position in which he gets an opportunity. When you keep the focal point in the attack in, it still keeps the attention of the defenders. But now that you don't have that presence there, now you're kind of like, all right, well, we don't have that threat. The other thing I would say about Erling Haaland, obviously as a striker, I would want to be out on the field. And, and, and as a fellow striker, and Jurgen would attest to this, the last thing you want to do is being taken off when the game is still mm -hmm. on the line. But you also have to perform at a level that it rewards or that indeed demands you stay on the field. And there were many times, and I mean many times, where the ball gets played into Erling Haaland and Nacho, who on the list of defenders for Real Madrid, it's actually behind Chuameni, who's not even a defender. But we have seen Carlo Ancelotti use Chuameni because he doesn't quite trust Nacho per se to play in a, in a moment like this. He had to because Chuameni was suspended. And he was natural that is buddying up Erling Haaland. I'm like, hold on a second. Isn't Erling Haaland supposed to be the strong, big presence guy, the physical guy? Why is he getting thrown around by Nacho? Why is he getting thrown around by other defenders? Hold the ball You off. can lay it off to the Bruyne and he can find the next pass. Or lay it off to Rodrigo. Now he can find the next pass. If you don't f have that hold up play, then you cannot spin out and go into space. We want our Erling Haaland to get out into space. Well, he's got to do the dirty part first and that's hold the ball up. He doesn't do that. He cuts out his own opportunities. Do you agree, Robbo? Absolutely. I was watching him very, very closely. And four out of the first five times he touched the ball, and as, just as Ali said, the ball was rolled into him, up against Nacho. He, t he fell over once. He gave the ball away the second time. Nacho went and nicked it off him twice, and he, did, he laid one ball off out the, out the first five or six times. He, his performance wasn't good enough. And then he loses confidence. And I was looking at his movement when they could have rolled the balls into his feet. I know they don't look at it very often, but there was times when Rodri was looking at it and Haaland was making a run across the pitch. He wasn't sort of saying, I'm going to back into the centre, roll it into me around the box, and now I'm going to get myself turned. Because the top strikers love the ball rolled into them in and around the box so they can get themselves turned, get shots away. At the moment, he has to have a goal made for him. He's not going to create any goals by himself by individual brilliant play. Brilliant play. That's not what he's doing at the moment. He's lost his confidence. He seems to have lost his technical ability with his back to goal. It's a problem, I think, for Man City. But how many, you're not going to get a goal made for you if you're sitting on the bench, are you? <laughs> right. That's a fair point. But, but how, <laughs> how, many, how many strikers do we know, and I've seen over the years, that have done absolutely nothing in a game but, but toe poke the ball in the back of the net yeah. and take the headlines? Mm -hmm. Oh, I've, I've, we've seen them. I've you played, can take it all the way back to Klinsmann. A player that have done nothing. <laughs> that German guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But I'm being serious now. We can argue, we can debate. He should have come off. He shouldn't have come off. He's playing well. He's not playing well. Blah blah blah. At the end of the day, there are so many front men out there. And I've, I'll give you an example. One I, I, I played with, Ali McCoist. Right. A lot of times, McCoist, you, you couldn't see him if he sent a search party out for him. Right. And then all of a sudden, he'd pop up like he did, instinctive, a finisher in the box, and he's taking the headlines the next day. The manager took that out of the equation, and that's what he is. He's not the most subtle of footballers, mm. Erlen Haaland, but he's a finisher. But he's going through a bad time, I'll give you that, or a bad time by his standards. But, but he took away the potential for him to have a moment and take the headlines. You don't always need your front men to be the best player on the team. You just need them when you put a good ball in the box to be in the right place at the right time. And I thought it was telling that he took him off. What do you think, Jürgen? Yeah, you can look at it from both both sides. Obviously, you know, you give Alvarez the, the chance to be the difference maker in that moment, which he can any time. I mean, he's a very, very good striker as well. And for Erlen, even if it's not his, his best game, 
certainly he can still decide the game. It just needs one one ball. You know, it just needs one opportunity, and he's back. You know, and his confidence is suddenly back. And this is how how the life of uh, strikers are. The life life of the striker is just to to wait for the next ball and uh, turn things around. And for sure, he will be. He will be frustrated, he will be disappointed with the, the outcome of the game, with the, also with his own performance probably. But still, I mean, he hit the, he hit the cross bar with his header, if that goes in. And you know, we all saw that ball already in. He's, he's, he's the match winner then at the end of the day. But those are things that um, a manager and Pep Guardiola has done that so many times and will do it hopefully for many, many years to go still. You know, they, they feel certain things. They, they, see, they see it during the week, they talk to the players. Uh, they know exactly where, where the players are. And then uh, based on those uh, observations that they have during training sessions, outside of training sessions, you know, when you uh, move around with the team and you travel and all that stuff, then they, they, they make their decisions based on what they've experienced the whole week. And that's why he made that decision to, to bring in Alvarez and uh, um, instead of a, of a midfielder, you know, take, take the, uh, Erlen Haaland out. Um, and he also will think about it now, and he always will, you know, question: Should I have done that or than this? Uh, but the game is over, and the game is over, and uh, Real Madrid uh, is through, and uh, with a very defensive display, and uh, with a lot of uh, things that they learned last year with the defeat there. Um, and you got to give them a huge compliment. We talked about the vulnerability of Manchester City's defence going into this tie, certainly compared to last season. How poor, how poor was conceding that Rodrigo goal, Robbo? Uh, it was uh, a, a bad bit of defending because the Kanji, as we said, was stepping into midfield. Uh, are we being a little harsh? It's not just unlucky, Manchester City, just one of those days, considering how much of the ball they had, how they dominated a team like Real Madrid who are going to win La Liga. Arsenal at home, same thing. Chelsea at home, Chelsea, mm -hmm. by the way, 1-1, one, one. same thing. Had the ball all day, couldn't score. Well, couldn't score a second. <laughs> Uh, so we've seen it. We've seen it before. And look, they're a great side. They're a great side. You can still argue they are the best side to watch in European football, but they just haven't got it done. They just haven't got it done. And I'm amazed. You know, I think on the other side, on the other side of it is, is Real Madrid. Here is a side that's going to win La Liga, that could well win the Champions League. And you talk about adversity. Mm -hmm. Benzema, Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. gone. Down the spine of the team, you got. Cross at 34, Modric bit part at 38. Yeah, you got youngster, you got Bellingham. Obviously, he's come in and he's been a revelation, but he's lost a little bit of uh, a step in his performance. And then you have a back four that's had, as Ali said, Nacho in there, Chouameni in there, Camavingo in there. Uh, it's had uh, three or four different left backs. It's had Carvajal playing centre half. Mm -hmm. It's had two goalkeepers that are not the best. They've, they've figured it out that Lunin's the best of the two of them, him and Kepa, and yet here we are. No other manager, in my opinion, no other manager would have been able to get Real Madrid to this position other than Carlo Ancelotti with this calm demeanour, managing the players, not panicking, just using all his experience and fighting the fires that he's had to fight. Not been brilliant, not been, no. not been aesthetically the best on the eye, but just knowing what it's all about, getting results. And to do it, having lost all those players and have the season that they potentially are going to have, is quite amazing. And that's it, we've, seen, we've seen a lot of Real Madrid haven't yeah. we, this okay. season, and they haven't been brilliant. They haven't been scintillating. They're going to win La Liga because they're the best team in Spain, mm. but they're up against, for example, a Barcelona side who have struggled early on. Yeah, and to take it even further, Courtois, Alaba, yeah. Militao, it's, it's starters. Mm -hmm. No doubt starters. Guys that were going to be your starters for the length of the season and that have been outstanding performers for Real Madrid out, and yet you continue to get results. And what you find from Real Madrid, sometimes we ask of this team's identity, personality. Well, this is what Real Madrid has in bunches, personality. And speaking of personalities, I, I cannot let this conversation go on without mentioning Antonio Rudiger. Look, first of all, the, the last three penalty kick takers for Real Madrid, Lucas Vazquez, Nacho, and Antonio Rudiger, when they woke up this morning, they would not have thought that they were going to be taking a penalty. They could not have imagined that they would be taking a penalty. But regardless, Lucas Vazquez steps up, goal. Nacho, goal. And the fifth penalty kick taker in a quarterfinal of Champions League, Antonio Rudiger. Now, 
The only reason I can imagine that this guy is taking a penalty is because he has the personality and the character to say, yeah, give me the ball. I don't care. Give me the ball. I'll be the guy. I'll take on the pressure. And what he has done this season is that he has taken on the responsibility to be the one reliable center back that they have. One reliable center back that they have had the whole season has been Antonio Rudiger, and he has been outstanding for Carlo Ancelotti, and he was outstanding again tonight. Fewer players, fewer players in the modern game, and we, like, we, I'm not talking about just talent, fewer, fewer players wear their heart on the sleeve mm. more than Tony Rudiger. Yeah. Who, of course, and, didn't play in the second leg last year. And, and sometimes, and don't forget, under, I think it was under Lampard at Chelsea, he was out of the equation, wasn't he? He was persona non grata. Mm. But... That in the modern day, if ever you want to talk about the, the, the dazzling stuff that goes on in the game and all the skill levels we see, to see somebody with his experience and his know-how, and a German international, he's played all over the place, uh, he's now playing for arguably the biggest club in the world, but to have that passion and that drive and wear your heart on his sleeve, as I said, is something I think a lot of people watching and playing the game could, could take something out of, rather than, you know, just looking for bits of skill and bit. And the amount of passion that he, ha that he has and heart to step up, play the way that he has, has been amazing to watch. And, and what's incredible and, and still maybe surprises people, Jürgen, is that Real Madrid are Real Madrid because of the success they've had in this Champions League competition and European Cup, obviously, before that. And really, it shouldn't matter if a team won it five times in the 60s or won it back-to-back. -back All these different facts shouldn't really affect what goes on today, but it clearly does. Obviously, it's a big part of confidence. You know, when you look back into your club's history and you see that, you know, whatever, you know, team was going far in the Champions League and one, I, don't mean, I don't know how many domestic titles, this kind of builds this, this belief, this, this confidence then to go always forward. You know, in Real Madrid is that phenomenon, similar to a bit Bayern Munich, is, as we talked about that many times, we obviously talk about that game with Arsenal as well later on. But um, when you step on the field um, as a player and you face Real Madrid, you're not looking at how Real Madrid played last week, maybe in Villarreal or, or on another team or at Petit, Petit Sevilla or, or wherever. Um, you, you, look, you look at what this club is all about. You, know, you, you understand that these, the, these players that are on the other side of the field now warming up, they've done it all. And that gives you so much... Uh, I mean, it, it intimidates you. It uh, tells you. It tells you so much more. And then when they step up in decisive moments of the Champions League, when it hits down to the to the final eight, then all these things matter. They matter a lot. You know, if you have now, if Tony Gross is now one year older or younger, it doesn't really matter. It's Tony Gross. You know? And so it's Antonio Rüdiger, who since years is, yeah, here and there he has a bad game and has a bad moment and has a bad experience. But overall... He's consistently playing for one of the best teams in the world. And that forms you, that gives you that confidence. And that gives you also the, the moment to understand, oh, I got to step it up now. I'm not the perfect penalty taker, maybe, but give me the ball. I walk up there and I give it a shot. And he hit it in. He, <laughs> he hit a little bit the inside of the post as well. So that's how, <laughs> how close it was at the end of the day. But that's the beauty of the story then. And uh, yeah. He walks now out and uh, obviously totally happy and now in the semifinals and, uh, and there comes the next game, the next game to prove yep. it all. And then uh, we go into a summer where they have to prove it all. All these big names that we see now in the quarterfinals, they have to show up then in the European Championship or in the Copa America uh, and prove it again, week in, week out. Uh, next up for Real Madrid, it's a little matter of, oh, a classico. Oh, okay. uh, they take on Barcelona <laughs> on Sunday. Meanwhile, Manchester City's hopes of a, du a double treble are dead, but they could still do the double-double, yes, uh, as they take on Chelsea. Well, there won't be a double-double because they did a treble last year. Yeah, but they could still do the domestic no, double-double. I'm not taking one off. Uh, <laughs> uh, that'll be our first game on what is a great weekend of soccer on ESPN Plus, the City take on Chelsea. Thank you, Jürgen. Why? Thank him. Why am I thanking you? I'm not talking Bayern Munich. Oh, that's it? <laughs> no, 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 we're done. No, 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 no